Matthew Ward, usually shortened to Ultramarine fanboy number one or the Emperor of Scub. Damned be his name. Matt Ward the Scub Lord, that stupid fucking moron or our spiritual leech, was one of the game's designers at Games Workshop and the Lord of Changing Fluff, the 420 Noscoper and the bringer of Mary Sue's. In truth, he was the whipping boy during a time when Games Workshop was being very poorly managed. Ward is an extremely controversial figure amongst neckbirds for a variety of reasons enumerated ad nauseum below. It's probably telling that this page was one of the most fought over pages in the site's history. Seriously, the amount of scub this guy produces in general is astronomical, and bringing him up in the presence of the many, many factions this guy has spawned is liable grounds for flame wars, derp and rage. In 2014, Ward announced he was on sabbatical from Games Workshop. This was due to online death threats from morons which prompted a big change in GW policy and also spontaneous street parties. Ward later emerged with a three-book deal with a major publisher, so not Black Library. Then, behold, the great beast has come. Destroyer of Verisimilitude. I'm a new player. Who is this guy? Matt Ward was a games designer for Games Workshop. That means he wrote codices and army books. He was responsible for both the rules themselves, the crunch, and the background behind the army, the fluff. Once, GW had a policy of putting the lead writer's name on the front of a codex, despite all them being collaborations. TGS seething response to anything with Ward's name on it's changed that and now no single author is ever credited. Our mothers are extremely proud of this achievement. Why does TG hate this guy so much? The reason why TG hates this guy so much can be summarized into two different answers. The first and most painfully honest answer is because we need to blame someone for our woes, and he was the easiest target. The second answer is because he messed up a lot, a lot, for many, as can be seen by the plethora of TG May chapters here on 1D4chan. The true appeal of 40k is designing a unique, colorful army with a rich history and engaging heroes. Good players of 40k like to put a certain amount of themselves into their lovingly assembled and painted armies, and they like their army to reflect their own sensibilities and ideals. That's what makes an army truly belong to a player. That's what makes them special. Ward does this too. But the difference is that he can write the official fluff and therefore gets to declare that his interpretation of said army is the correct one through the books he writes. Those heroes you may have liked before now seem like entirely new people. And the armies you liked before now seem to be an entirely different force you never wanted to play as. While this kind of change isn't anything new to 40k, the reason people single Ward out more for it is because the other authors, most notably Phil Kelly, at least try to keep some of the themes in the new book so that they feel like the old army with a new shade of paint, rather than some alien force wearing the skin of the one you used to like by those metrics. It's widely believed that Ward made some of the most broken books ever published by Games Workshop, which is really saying something, and that he systematically destroyed the fluff to fit his own childish and incoherent vision of the 40k and fantasy universes. Chief among his flaws is that his stories and rules utterly lack restraint. Yes, even by the over-the-top standards of Warhammer. For instance, in his Necrons book, he casually introduced a small faction that has the power to detonate any star in the galaxy with a click of its fingers. But the most rage-inducing codex he has made thus far is the Space Marines Codex, which explicitly states that all chapters, excluding a few aberrants, behave and think in exactly the same manner as his army, the Ultramarines. He spells out the organization patterns the ideologies, who they revere and why and just assumes that everyone else automatically accepts this radical shift in logic from thinking of the blue boys as all-rounder guys with a roman motif to tear best chapter ever. It's believed by some that the codex was supposed to be called Codex Ultramarines and was changed at the last minute by G-dubs. It still would have been stupid, but we could have easily written it off as macro propaganda instead of spending 11 years bitching about it. Of course, players can still make their own factions and think up whatever backstories they want for them. But with Ward's fluff, they'll never measure up to his smurfs. This could easily be written off as the bitter anger of the old veterans. 
and on some level, it is, but when analyzing Ward's works, and his reactions to works by other codex and fluff writers, patterns quickly emerge, and one cannot ignore this. The flaw is inescapable, and Ward enforces it in all his writing with sincerity and vigor. Just to ignore Ward's fluff, you say I like your moxie, but the reality is this. Players play fluffy armors, the cannon law does matter to them. And though try as they might to ignore the glaring fact that the cannon fluff is forever altered by creating little pockets of what they believe should be the fluff, it all feels exactly as it sounds. Like a personal delusion that ignores the facts. If you found out one day that your family actually doesn't exist, you could still maintain the belief that they do, but it will never be true. That's how it feels. And it is painful to play as these armies and to see their fluff change so much, or to be reminded constantly when you play against them. And Ward's codices have been very successful. Look at the number of people playing Grey Knights, Blood Angels, and Necrons these days ruthlessly exploiting every bit of cheese they can find and purchasing all the new, shiny, overpriced models for them. Besides all that, Ward's other major problem is that he just isn't a tactician. Only rarely does he try to write factions using any kind of thought to dictate their battle tactics. The closest he's come to writing military doctrine was the Necron Codex, and instead maintains a tell. Don't show policy. That is, usually, He'll just tell the player that somebody is a tactical genius without anything to show for it. The majority of Ward's heroes lead head first, sacrificing all in frontal assaults that could be circumvented with more ingenuity. Or, as another example, he tells us that Marnius Kalgar is a patient tactical genius who considers the danger of an incoming projectile before taking cover. The image painted in the average person's mind in that case is one of Kalgar analyzing a falling bomb until it strikes him in the head and explodes, at which point he decides, yes, that one was dangerous. I probably should have taken cover from that one. The above average person would also probably understand that the metaphor was supposed to mean that Kalgar is ready to take a blow when needed. The biggest offender by far of Ward's tell. Don't show policy is called a Drago, the Grey Knight's supreme grandmaster, whose main personality trait is supposed to be badass. Without rhyme, reason, or feasible explanation. Drago simply exists as this whirlwind of enemy destroying fiction in his codex. He pops in and out of the war, wrecking everything, everywhere, without so much as a minute of exposition or explanation. Drago is a concept, a meaningless one without any emotional impact. He's not a person or anything to which the average person can even attempt to relate because all Ward can write about is how badass he's supposed to be. Ward has simply declared him the best ever, and he has done so in canon. So it is. Also, this isn't helped by the fact that the Grey Knights are already a very tell. Don't show chapter. Ever since they were introduced, every amazing feat they perform has been kept under a whole chest full of locks and keys. As for Ward's crunch, it goes without saying that it is unbalanced. With several armies he wrote, read, Grey Knights and Necrons, essentially flattening everything from here to hell. But the main issue is that they're essentially all over the place in terms of rules. Although Ward could be excused for this in light of GW's tendency to force new sets on people for the sake of profit, the most damning example of his crunch making skills isn't in 40k, but in fantasy. When he wrote the 7th edition Demons of Chaos Codex, it was so overpowered, so unbalanced that it practically destroyed the edition's overall balance and forced G-Dubs to build a whole new edition to even begin to staunch the bleeding. Whether you decide war deserves the rage and hate he gets, write it off as a sad consequence of his earlier work, pity him for having to work for GW, or simply don't give a shit is entirely your call. As ever, on TG, we urge you to make your own decisions. Either way, he's not the best writer they have, but he's also not the worst and his reputation will follow him in his endeavors from now until time immemorial, for good or for ill. Of course, hating his extreme fuck-ups in lore and rule writing is one thing. Sending him angry emails and trying to find where he lives is another. Saving grace. To be fair, Matt can write reasonable fluff, like the world engine, which this former Necron player admits is awesome despite ripping off Star Wars in several ways, 
the world engine is just a renamed Death Star, and the Rebel Flare Space Marines have to destroy it, Castellan Crow, who even the severely buffed for Demon Hunters now GK player has to admit is pretty fucking cool, or Traz in the Infinite. And then there's Pyrtus Folly, but for every good piece of fluff he's done, there's a bunch of called Erdragus and Corner Knights to sift through, and in the eyes of a staggering plurality on TG, that's a big part of why he's disliked. Another point, he's able to create crunch that is fine on its own, like the Space Marine Codex, or Necrons before 6th edition buffed them to the Stratosphere, and perfectly balance against his other books, a tray he shares with Vetok. The special rules he writes are usually interesting, creative, and useful, making his armies very distinct from the others, and capable of doing things nothing else in the game can. You know, things like all assault marine blood angels, furiosos blood talons and magna grapple, teleporting dread knights or necron minchical scarabs, entropic strike and deep striking in the enemy movement phase, usually adding more fun into the game, albeit at the cost of balance against other armies. In fact, he helped create other army special rules, like the Elder Battle Focus. Unwardified codices of 6-7e tend to change those interesting things into something mundane, simple and often less powerful, sometimes to the point of uselessness. Rip minchicles and assault troops, or removing them entirely. However, the fairest thing to level at Ward is the fact that, in his absence, GW hasn't stopped making shitty decisions with their intellectual property and arguably started long before his tenure. This tells us it was less about Ward's flaws seeping into and contaminating the game, insofar as it was his employer using him as a scapegoat to take the heat off their profit-driven cheesemongering. Yes, they needed someone to write these abominations, but every writer at GW has problems writing books at some point. In essence, Ward was the perfect author for GW's shift to an all-SM production across all lines. His admittedly bad writing gave us someone to blame and, at the same time, gave GW the sales burst they desired but couldn't figure out how to justify, lest their moves become noticeable by the community and a substantial revenue risk. Oh, and he also had a hand in the plot of Battlefleet Gothic. Armada YI and was a creative consultant for Vermintide 2 it tells something about 4chan and the internet that there doesn't seem to be much mention of that fact when the script is so widely praised. Odds are you've just found out by reading this very sentence. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for Kumjar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeacontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Factions of Ward. The various viewpoints on Ward can be broken up into seven factions. Like most of TGS interdepartmental bickering. This is by no means a comprehensive list and the various factions can come in various flavors of this guy and that guy. Some would argue more of the latter, and others more of the former. The old guard maintain that Ward is the Antichrist. Loudly complain when he's writing a new codex and vehemently hates his fluff. Will fight to the bitter end decrying that Ward's rules are overpowered, but is notable mostly for his utter hatred of Ward's fluff and complete disregard of previously established canon. The most devout of them focus their hatred on the Necron Codex. More than simple alterations isolated to the Necron fluff and the 6-8 Codex. They vehemently remind people that in messing with the past, Ward had completely changed Warhammer 40k history, affecting such things as the origins of Nulls, Necron motivation, their battles with the Elder, and due to the notorious allies chart, changing the very manner in which every race interacts. The vet gamer differs from the old guard in that whilst the old guard hates for primarily the fluff, 
The vet gamers hate him for the crunch. They see Ward's nonsense as indicative of the power creep that the game suffered for quite some time. Often citing Warhammer 40k's flagrantly game-breaking Blood Angels Codex at launch. Or Warhammer Fantasy's Demons Codex as a sign of where everything went wrong. The indifferent. These are people who have no opinion as to whether Ward is good or bad. They are neutral on this subject and just want people to shut the fuck up or too ignorant to realize how awful he is. The crunch defenders hold that while Matt Ward does write atrocious fluff, his crunch is fair and balanced. They also defend the viewpoint that ultimately, crunch is more important than fluff because you can ignore bad fluff. Also known as work players, the counterculture. Love Ward on the grounds that the old guard hate him too much. TGS version of hipsters. The cult of Ward. These are people who agree Ward's older books suck but believe he's getting better. And all the suck of the older books were over exaggerated. Or even a good writer now. The Ward bearers. Either an extremist faction of the cult of Ward or fanatics who worshipped him anyway. The direct opposite of the old guard. The Wardenites worship Ward as a god. Following the revered Book of Ward, they are identified by defending Ward. But whereas Crunch defenders only defend Crunch and either agree with the old guard and or the indifferent in regards to fluff, Wardenites defend both. Whereas the counterculture like him because it makes them look edgy, the Wardenites hold that he is legitimately good. Often quotes from the Book of Ward, usually from the Crudux and the Mana Bould. Matthew Ward Deliverus. They hold Robin Crudace as the great Satan. It is suspected that the Wardenites have a strong power base in the Necrons and Tyranid communities. It should be noted, like most religions, there are different sects within the cult of Ward. The theological divides between them mostly concerning Codex. Grey Knights. The sects supporting Grey Knights are also divided amongst pro and anti-Drago sects. And now recently these sects have become even more diverse thanks to a certain passage in the New Demons Codex. It's also worth noting that if a member of the Old Guard and a member of the Cult of Ward meet, there will be blood spilled. Such is also true of a vet gamer and crunch defender meeting. Matt Ward's writing highlights. This image is considered by most to be tacit proof that Matt Ward is going to a very special place in hell when he dies. For a while Matt Ward worked for Games Workshop and, initially, his works were not too bad. Over time the problems arose. Yet Games Workshop kept trusting him with more important projects. They seem to be under the misconception that Matt Ward was their best writer when his popularity, that many people kept using his armies, was more likely due to three things. They got him to write for their most popular armies with the players choosing to put up with Ward's flawed writing rather than give up their army and throw away the money time they invested. The power gamers loved his armies as they were overpowered at first and the newcomers to the hobby were ignorant of the previous state of the game. So they could have been unaware of how unbalanced it had become and how often Ward ruined the continuity of the game and writs con so much previously established lore. 2002-2007 Ward authors are bunch of Lord of the Rings books. Revisionist neckbuds now like to point to them as damning proof of Ward's madness in its infancy, but mostly they're just forgettable. During this time, he also worked for White Dwarf. His only real defining feature being his fondness for playing the evil armies in battle reports. In hindsight, this was probably a sign of things to come. He also creates the rules for the Mumical, the most fucking ridiculous unit ever which can destroy entire armies in its movement. The Mumical is eventually revealed to be so broken, and included in an army that already had its share of cheese, that it signals the beginning of the end for the Lord of the Rings system. On a Warhammer Fantasy note, 7th edition Orcs and Goblin book, with really stupid fluff mistakes and the appearance of a wizard from magic colleges in Gorbad Siege thousands of years before their foundation. He also teamed up with the long lost Anthony Reynolds to write the 6th edition Wood Elves Army book. The fluff was passable and the crunch had a few gems. Thanks to Reynolds, 2008 Ward's descent into scub and infamy begins with army book, Demons of Chaos. A work of such apocalyptic cheesemongering it is widely credited for single-handedly breaking WHFB. No army could come close to beating it. Dark Elves and Vampire Counts, accepted a second and third powerful in the rankings, generally had to struggle to grab draws, 
and the failing attempts at power creep to match eventually broke the entire system so hard that fantasy required a hard reset in the form of the massive shakeup that was 8th edition. Most people write it off as an overeager premiere, and whether this was Ward's own work or management fiat remains a point of conjecture. It was bad enough that a balance patch of sorts had to be made in an attempt to keep the meter intact. It didn't work. This might have been where GW started to think that broken rules lead to increased sales. See Elder in 7th edition for a concrete example of that, at the expense of their core demographic, though later on that just became their mission statement. Either way Ward didn't seem to get into hot company water over all this, and would go on to write several other books for worse than better, in that order. The saving grace is the fluff which in general is quite good. Putting Chaos in a better written and more grounded light compared to Ward's contemporaries. Ward is instrumental in the creation of the Warhammer 40,000 rulebook. 5th edition rulebook. While the crunch is more or less accepted, much of the fluff openly contradicts previous works, sisters being all but retconned out of the universe for example and there's considerable attempts to promote certain armies over the others. Ward writes Codex. Space Marines for 5th edition. Thousands of neckbirds cry out in terror, and are silenced. While he manages to make this work mechanically stable, it comes at a terrible cost. Ward unilaterally decides to retcon massive amounts of Space Marine fluff and enshrine the Ultramarines as the gold standard for a proper Space Marine. The new fluff reads like Ultramarines fanfic. Portraying the Smurfs as second to the Emperor in physical attribution damned near all regards and that all space marines view Marnius Kalga as their spiritual liege. It is about this time that Ward's prejudices against certain chapters start to emerge for the first time. 2009 Ward writes War of the Ring with Jeremy Vertuk, a completely different style of game for the Lord of the Rings model lineup and the basis for some of the new rules in the 8th edition of Fantasy, which will help clean up after the mistakes of Demons of Chaos. The book isn't bad. But the fact the Lord of the Rings hasn't been popular since 2001 to 2003. Cheesy units on certain sides, elves for example, the book having its fair share of mistakes, mostly typos, and the fact that the system was so radically different from the previous versions, it played like a cross between the lot of strategy game and Warhammer Fantasy prevented it from becoming all that popular. Ward is sent back to writing 40k and fantasy. 2010 Ward doubles down on his heresy with Codex, Blood Angels. Any and all pretense of restraint is dropped and the Codex is loaded with deep striking land raiders, flying library and dreadnoughts, and Ikes that can unscrew a badon's head and shit down his neck. Ward devises new weapons and abilities for the Blood Angels, giving them evocative names like Blood Fists. Blood Talons, Blood Reavers, Blood Croziuses, Blood Lances, Blood Boil, Blood Shoot Bolts, and Blood Strike Missiles. That's right, Blood Strike, Sea Codex, Wolf Wolves, The Fluff, while not the hate crime against Neckbuds his previous work was, still manages to inspire rage by having the Necrons and Blood Angels become super secret pony princess unicorn best friends forever. If only temporarily. As fate would have it, this work will not survive the next edition too well. 2011 War gives birth to Codex. Grey Knights. Fusing the awful fluff and limitless cheese of his two previous works into a single abomination. While Sifflemen sweep tournament after tournament, Ritter fags rage impotently about Call the Drago, Cornet Knights, and the unapologetic rape of over 10 years of canon. Ward co authors the new White Dwarf release of Codex. Sisters of Battle. He shows incredible restraint by giving the sisters some respectable fluff, but compensates by basically reverting the witch hunters to 2e. The Force Org chart is gutted out, allies are removed, and the best strategies are promptly eliminated, with a bit of help from the nerfer in chief Robin Crudence. Ward next turns his fell hand to the Necron. He ups the ante again by completely rewriting their backstory, presumably while humming to himself with a shit-eating grin plastered to his face. The Crons are now insane tomb kings, in spas, who want your body. Oh and they turned the Setan into Pokemon. Yay. Mechanics-wise the release fares surprisingly well, trading away some of the more egregious cheese of 3e. Monolith Death March, 
in order to eliminate its shittiest design flaws. Phase out. Some argue that it changes Necrons to the point that it would have been easier to change their name altogether and you know. Some people could have taken up Necrons because they liked them as they were. Anyway, in its few improvements, the fluff manages to dodge Matt Ward's greatest flaw. 2012 Matt Ward teams up with Adam Troke and Jeremy Vettuk to create Wardhammer 40. 0006 edition. The whole rulebook promptly turns codex, necrons and codex, grey knights into rape trains with no brakes, though they are later surpassed by TAU and Elder. Every single far TGUI instantly regrets ever thinking the space tomb kings were balanced in the first place. We're talking cheese like 9 flyers in a 1500 points list with flying dedicated transports that don't kill passengers when they crash what the fuck. Among other rage worthy things of note include massive buffs to already broken beyond reason armors. Highly abusable mechanics resulting in severely limited builds for HQ choices, tool for challenges or suffer, and the Space Marine segments of the fluff being full of yet more Mad Ward porno. 2013 Mad Ward Rewrite Army Book, Demons of Chaos 480. Many neckbuds commit suicide before the official product announcement is out to save themselves from the predicted cheese. Many fantasy power gamers also ritually sacrifice themselves in anticipation of a gargantuan nerfing. In the book, Matt Ward nerfs all the overpowered units of the previous army book, puts a lot of random effects, random magic items, and does things such as taking one of the worst units of the previous book, Beast of Burgle, improve it and reduce its cost by 40 points each, or giving demons one of the best cannons in the game. Overall they ended up as one of the better armies, but nowhere near the overpowered rape train they were last edition. Aside from some questionable fluff, it's not all that bad. Matt Ward heads the team that made the 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy update for the High Elves. It's really, really good. No, really the Ever Queen and her units were added back in and come off as pretty awesome. Tyrion retains his awesome wartime skills while being less of a Mary Sue, being given a short temper and occasional moodiness. The book also fixes a lot of the cheese that the High Elves got away with in the older book, like every time we cast spells it's irresistible force and that we always strike first with freaking great weapons. The fluff is good, although it's arguable how much Ward is responsible for the fluff since it's mostly copy pasted from earlier editions, and the army is pretty well balanced, both internally and externally, except for one thing, banner of the mythifying world dragon, 2 plus ward save against anything magical, and you know what army has only magical attacks that's right, demons of chaos, most people feel this is blatantly unfair, hell, most reviews went out of their way to point it out, because it's just that egregious, but a small number chuckle likely every time it comes up, because they remember the days when demons always won. Yet the previous versions gave complete immunity to spells, were cheaper and there are currently a few spells and rules that ignore ward saves in 8th edition. This one also makes all dragons within 12 stubborn, but that applies to allied and enemy dragons. Furthermore, only one unit in the army benefits from it if the character carrying the banner joins them, thus rendering those complaints somewhat invalid. Writing the Codex, Elder Supplement about Craft World Diandon. It's two pages of crunch with the rest being fluff for $40. Said fluff consists of turning Iandon into a clone of Bealtan, forgetting how the infinity circuit works, retconning more or less everything involving in it, and turning Iandon's leadership into incompetence who didn't think that Tyranids were a serious threat. That said, a number of Elder players loved it because it's one of the few fluff bits that doesn't treat the Elder as the universe's punching bag, which is far more than what can be said about most of their fluff, and gave them a little street cred. Writing the Dark Elves 8th edition update, and according to White Dwarf is now GW's go-to guy for all things Elven and WFB. Good news, the crunch is passable. Dark Elves have army-wide always strike first like High Elves do while retaining High Elf hatred. Also murderous prowess with some units getting buffed significantly with slight nerfs to balance them. Which Elves? They also gain a glass cannon sea monster that doesn't have any rules to let it move through water, 
justified in fluff so it can't escape its handlers. The bad news is Matt Ward like usual reroad ignored some of the established fluff to suit his tastes. Though in this case it's very minor. For example Clark Aaron is the Beastmaster's city instead of Care and Car like it was in every previous edition. They both deal in slaves but Clark Aaron has most of the monsters now. Even though or maybe because it's also the Dark Elves' main shipyard. Leaving Care and Car out in the cold. Literally in the fluff. Malekith also gets an ex-wife. While not badly written it seems out of character for him and he never had one before. Another change is the fluff suggesting incest between Malekith and Morathi has been removed. Now it's changed that Morathi is wet for her stepson, Tyrion, who she thinks to use to reincarnate Inarian in a magic ritual to name a few. He had a hand in the New Wood Elves update. The fluff is good, though there have been changes to some of the characters, such as Ariel having a dark side and being more gullible. She's manipulated by her archenemy Morga, as well as Morathi. The personality of each incarnation of Orion is influenced by the person sacrificed to revive him. And Score the Falconer is no more. The heavy hand of Thorpe in writing is also present, jacking off chaos at the expense of the previously established self cannon. Crunchways the Wood Elves are arguably better at shooting, and definitely close combat, than before. But there were some major nerfs handed out to a few things. Dryads, Treemen and especially their magic items. The lore of Athel Loren is also gone, making the race of isolationists feel more like a race of bipolar copycats. Writing Codex, Sentinels of Terror. He was a part of a team effort to write the book and put in charge of writing the fluff. Mostly talks about things anybody who has ever read anything about the Imperial Fist would know from other writings. Emphasizes on their pride and stubbornness being both their biggest strength and weakness. Went a little too far on the assaulting when the Fist has best no for deference fighting and century and squads are awesome. Gotta push the new stuff. And the fluff does only focus on one crusade. Confusing them a bit with the Black Templars, though they are a successor chapter, and killing off their chapter master. 2014 going by the writer's trays below, it looks like Ward may have had a hand in the new Dwarfs Codex for WFB. For example, it has good balance but like the last book still allows them to field a potentially cheesy gunline army. The fluff is mostly unchanged though the few new bits make heavy use of the special characters and a few uses of the word alas. It turns out that Ward quietly left GW on May 2014, with the Wood Elves being his last army book. The exact circumstances behind his departure are unknown. As is how nobody knew about this until it was posted on his LinkedIn profile three months after it happened. But seeing that Robin Crades is still employed at GW it's not likely that the quality of his work had anything to do with it. Whatever issues there were around Mad Ward, some people took their hatred of him too far. One reason for his resignation was incoming real-life death threats that he received. Grimdock indeed. This adds a dark new twist to hiding the author's names. Perhaps it was to protect Matt Ward from potential attempts on life rather than to try and get one over on the fans. Actually, he's also come out in revealing that he's written parts of the end times, WHFB's super huge apocalypse event that's pretty much storm of chaos ii, electric boogaloo, taking special responsibility for writing the cane book, where he writes the last swan song for all the elves he wrote for. Predictably, it's the most scub book with some of the most insane plot twists out there. Malekith is the one true phoenix king Teclis was playing everyone along Tyrion as a murderous asshole. But considering what followed with Thankful and Archaeon, some have to consider just who exactly was behind the writing. His blog does indeed list that he did work on End Times Archaeon as well as Vermintide. Our liege has returned clench your butts everyone and hide yellow sisters. 2016 on his Twitter, Ward stated he's been rehired by Games Workshop as you can see here. Feel free to start whining now. 2017 when Petter writes a letter to GW whining about how wearing animal fur is wrong in a setting with literally all of the blood, gore, violence, and just generally not being nice to anything and everything. 
Ward responds with the following tweet. While not quite redeeming all his past misdeeds, it comes pretty close. Who knew Ward was such a marvelous fucking troll fans blame Ward for Gilliman's cheesy return. With the hilariously overpowered rules Gulliman has gotten and the fact that he now leads the Imperium once again, it's fair to say to suspect Ward. Turns out it was Phil Kelly. Who knew which explains why the Imperial Guard is overpowered. Balam keep complaints in the cheese section 2018 signs with the same literary agent who dealt with George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. 2019 his first epic fantasy novel, A Legacy of Ash, is released to rave reviews. The TV rights are already rumored to be hotly contested by various outlets. Seriously, don't bother the man. He no longer has anything to do with G-dubs, and even then, wasn't at fault for every law rape under the sun.